He has been a good leader, and he's a warm-hearted guy. I'm glad to have been present while when he was speaking, and I wish him well. <laughs> In the seven years of his pastorate here, the church has become just en enlivened with uh, participation. You know, it, uh, I remember what it was like seven years ago, and it's very clear that this is a much bigger, broader, and deeper church than it was then, and we have to owe a lot of that to David. David, thank you so much for all you've done for this church community. Um, I appreciate in particular your Buddhist-centered approach. Um, I have thought a lot about things as I've walked away from sermons and uh, they have made a difference in my life.
I've known David for probably five years, four to five years. Um, I hadn't been coming to the church uh, for a few years. I had been going during the 90s, but then hadn't been going. And I came back when uh, I was engaged to uh, my current wife. And uh, David was a very cheerful, welcoming presence. And my wife and now stepdaughter um, got to know him. And I'll remember David most for the wonderful way in which he married me and my wife and daughter. He allowed us to organize the ceremony and we included our stepdaughter, exchanged rings between Angela and I and also gave a ring to our to Angela's daughter, my stepdaughter, and helped us to arrange the whole ceremony and it worked out very nicely. So we really appreciate David's contribution to building our family. I'm just, yeah, not much on words, gonna keep this short and sweet. Okay. David Grimm, thank you. Well, thank you all for wonderful and almost eight years. Yeah, I've always seen you do this. Hold this ring, daughter. <laughs> Yes, think of it as an ice cream cone. Yeah. Yeah. Speak into it like this. Now I don't have to project. So thank you all. Really, this has been a wonderful almost eight years here. A blessing to me and my family. And I hope some contributions to this congregation as well. And may you thrive in the days, weeks, years ahead. And find some wonderful ministerial help. It's wonderful. I'm so grateful to have been here, and, uh, and one of the rules is, just so you know, when a UU minister leaves a church, they must not return to the church building for one year. So I won't be here, even though I will be sailing on the lake occasionally, and then okay, when we come back from San Diego. But anyway, so, what's that? See you on the new commons. That's right. It'll I mean, be come look at the new commons. Thank you, Francis. Yeah. We'll be all done. So thank you all, and uh, a great day. You all know. Do I have it in the right place? Yes. yes. <laughs> I've been in this church a long time. I've seen many ministers come and go. And there's always something that I remember especially about some of them, not all. Uh, for instance, the first minister here when John and I came was Ralph Halverson. And from Ralph, <clears throat> we learned why water canoeing? <laughs> um, I couldn't tell you what all we learned from people between Ralph Helverson and David Grimm, but you know what I'm going to remember most about David Grimm is the phrase, the beloved community. I, I once chided him for using the phrase too much. He put it three times in one paragraph. <laughs> But the more I think about it, the more I think it's a phrase that, that resonates with us and that I really like to call to mind. This certainly is a beloved community for me. And I thank you for that phrase that will always remind me of you. Still has an un unanswered question for me, which I'll uh, ask at the sermon of, oh, a year ago about uh, uh, altruism, so I'm waiting to hear an answer, but I'm not sure I'll get it now. So the way to California already, uh, but we do have a nice Garmin Nuvi GPS, which can be programmed for all kinds of waypoints between here and there, and not only will it give you step-by-step -step directions in voice on how to get to a campground in California, it will also repeat the step in the, re in the reverse process and guide you back to Ithaca. Yay. <laughs> And Reverend Grimm is married to a, cap a uh, 
Coast Guard certified captain, and I'm not saying, saying anything about, and I can share this because you have shared it, about your sailing prowess, um, <laughs> but we have a, and, and I have read this through seven times, it's like a Bible to me, sailing the basics <laughs> uh, for, for Reverend Graham. You can put that in there with your Nietzsche and philosophy well, and... Uh, <laughs> I will probably have to read the basics a few times. It's, it's a good read. It's, it's entertaining and, and that, that's a good one to start with. Thank you. And we have, last but not least, uh, lovely card, Marie, thank you. Uh, that you will s probably see it. This is, will still be available to be signed by Whoa. anyone. Whoa, thank you. As you oh, can wow. see, oh, yeah. nice. uh, a lot of folks have already. Uh, so if you have not had a chance to sign There's David Graham's retirement card, there's a <laughs> Please feel free to do so. I have a pen. Nobody has a pen. I am sure that we can find one. My office, I can find one. And there's a pen right there. And we had trouble finding a suitable <laughs> um, gift card. It's you're a tough man to shop for, um, but for the um, the balance of folks' generosity who wanted to, in that way, other than words, say thank you, um, here's some gas money. Oh. For, uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, you know the RV makes gas mileage that is really not that bad. We get Ooh. nine miles per gallon. <laughs> <laughs> well, it might be eight. <laughs> Once you park it, it's a good win. That's right. <laughs> Thanks, Francis. Once you park it, no more gas. Thanks so much. That's very generous of you. Wish it could be more. That's, no, that'll work for gas money or beer money. I didn't expect it. <laughs> <laughs> or, yes, scented candles. Yeah. So, thank you again. Thank um, you. It's oh. been our pleasure and we wish you all the best and look forward to hearing about your Western adventures when, uh, when you return. And we look forward to seeing. So we begin with a few readings. The first one is complicated. Written by a best-selling author who was a Unitarian Universalist minister. All I ever really needed to know, I learned kindergarten. Robert Fulgham, but this is not from that book, it's from another. He writes, I once began a list of some of the contradictory notions that I hold. For example, look before you leap, but he who hesitates is lost. Two heads are better than one. If you want to do something right, do it yourself. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Better safe than sorry. Out of sight, out of mind. Absence makes the heart grow fond. You can't tell a book by its cover. Clothes makes the man. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. It's never too late to learn. And so on, the list is longer than that, but that's not what I'll put on there. But Fulgham, who also taught school, and in high school, he said, I got so caught up in this kind of thinking that I wore two buttons on my smock when I was an art teacher in school. One button said, trust me, I am the teacher. And the other one said, question authority. <laughs> Second reading is from someone who I was so glad was from Ithaca, and when I moved here, I thought I'd get to meet him, but he died before I came. Carl Sagan. The last book he wrote. He said, I wish I could tell you about inspirational teachers in science from my elementary or junior high or high school days, but as I think back on it, there were none. 
There was rote memorization about the periodic table of elements and levers and inclined planes and green plant photosynthesis and the difference between anthra anthracite and bituminous coal. But there was no soaring sense of wonder, no hint of an evolutionary perspective, and nothing about mistaken ideas that everybody had once believed. In high school laboratory courses, there was an answer we were supposed to get, and we were marked off if we didn't get it. There was no encouragement to pursue our own interests or hunches or conceptual mistakes. It was our job as students merely to remember what we had been commanded. Get the right answer. And never mind if you don't understand what you're doing, just the right answer. From the book, Demon Haunted World. As Clarence Darrow put it so well, think about it. Just think of the tragedy of teaching children not to doubt. Don't question, don't doubt, just accept. I don't know about you, but I have such memories. I have the emotional heart. I was so excited about my teachers in middle school. I still remember them. I can still see myself sitting in their classes, and I remember one of them called me by the way I signed my name. My name was E. Grimm. Middle initial E attached to the Grimm. Don Raby and Waldo Loman. I'll never forget them. When I entered the sixth grade, I had left public school and started attending this intellectually rigorous, rigorous conservative Christian school, St. John Lutheran. Was what? And these teachers? Oh my gosh, they taught me so much. They were so, and it was small classrooms, and we had great interaction. It was just amazing. I am so grateful for all they shared with me and how much I learned from them. And yet, at the same time, I can really relate to those two buttons that Robert Fulgham wore when he was teaching. You know, trust me, I'm a teacher. Question authority. Now, I trusted my middle school teachers, Don and Waldo, or I should say Mr. Raby and Mr. Loman. I really did. I trusted them. They knew so much more than I did, and I was so excited to keep learning so many new things from them. But I'll never forget and I can still see this sitting where I was in the room when Waldo Bowman did a class one week on the origins of the universe based on the book of Genesis from the Bible. Questioning authority was second nature to me at that point. No, I thought evolution is a much better explanation than Genesis. And so let me just say, Thank God I had gone to public school before I went to St. John Lutheran, because at public school I had learned about evolution. And yet I still trusted Mr. Loman to teach classes, giving us the best that he knew and believed. And at the same time, I was free to doubt about what he knew and believed. He didn't have everything right. I was free to question it, free to look for better answers and explanations elsewhere. Doubting and questioning things can be an empowering way to live and learn and grow. And yet, not everybody wants to do it or has any idea what they're missing when they don't doubt or question. Now, I know some of you here have heard this story before, but it speaks volumes, and I do want to share it again, and it has to do with my dear mother. Well, I remember one time that my wife Pamela and I and my mother we at the Field Museum in Chicago. How many have been to the Field Museum? It's worth going to. As you know, my mother is a conservative Christian who takes the Bible to be literally the inerrant, inspired word of God. Every word. Well, after we had spent some time together in the Field Museum's exhibit of dinosaur skeletons, my wife asked my mother, amazing, huh? What do you think about all this? And my mother gave Pamela one of the most honest answers I had ever heard. She simply said, I try not to think about it. <laughs> I got chills 
just saying that. <laughs> and you know she's got a point. If what you've got is ultimate truth, you believe you've got the ultimate truth, what you believe, whatever it's from, it simply can't believe anything that contradicts that. Because, I mean, ultimate truth is, is what? Non-contradictable. So why waste your time thinking about some evidence or theory or argument that some people have come up with and they think contradicts the truth that you believe and know is ultimately true? Now, I knew many people who thought this way when I was growing up, including me for a while until I got to a certain age, I used to think of this kind of living as living in a box, a dogmatic box of ultimate truth. You're surrounded by it. You can't look at anything outside of it. You've got to be in this box. And there was awful, you know. There were so many things you couldn't think about. And as long as I lived in that box, it was hard to learn anything new. It was like, don't confuse me with the facts. My mind's already made up. I'm already surrounded by ultimate truth. I already know what's true. And it really was a good way to shut down the learning machine. And I didn't like that. Because I loved learning and I kept learning. But guess what? One day, I found a way out of that box. And who knows what key I found out to get myself out of that box. Anyone? Humility. Honest humility. That was the key for me, anyway, knowing that I'm a human being and I don't know everything. I don't have all the answers. In fact, to be honest about it, no human being does. Not even the smartest, wisest, most powerful human being has all the answers. No scientist or spiritual master or even someone who's the recipient of direct revelations from on high can completely understand or totally communicate ultimate truth. Ultimate truth is simply, ultimately beyond human reach. We will never arrive at ultimate truth, we'll never have all the answers, but we can move in the direction of better answers and closer to approximate ultimate truth. In other words, there's always more to learn than we currently know. And that's the wonderful thing. By honestly doubting absolute certainty of any idea or belief, we free ourselves from living in that limited egocentric box of imagined certainty about what's true and what's right and what's so. Whether that egocentric box is what you believe, and it's ultimately true, and you can't be wrong. Or your religion says it's ultimately true, and you can't be wrong. Or your political party's positions are ultimately true, and can't be wrong. But imagine that. By humbly admitting that nobody has ultimate truth, we're free to doubt and to question the best answers that we have today and to learn more and better ways of seeing things over time. As that old Italian proverb has it, where there's doubt, there's freedom. Freedom to explore, to experiment, to learn and grow in wisdom and understanding over time. Letting go of our self-righteous certainties about things we already know and believe can open up new possibilities for us. I'll never forget a handout, a paper handout I was given at the first Unitarian Universalist church I ever heard of, I joined. It was the Unitarian Church of Staten Island. It read, at this church, Nobody tells you what to think. Some people can't handle that. They're used to churches where you're told what to think and what to do and where you're warned about what will happen if you don't. At the Unitarian Church of Staten Island, you think for yourself and respect other people's right to do the same. It's a whole new idea in church going. An idea that Staten Islanders have been discovering since 1852. Amen. <laughs> Unitarian Universalism was new to me at the time, and I was so grateful to have found a church where I could think for myself, where I could hear what others thought and believed without having to unquestionably accept it as the truth, and where I 
was free to experience the truth at first hand for myself, directly experiencing it, and where I could keep on learning new and better things without end. And the pastor did that too. I can't begin to tell you how many times I disagreed with what he preached. And I won't say his name. He's at Shelter Island Unitarian Church now. I really did like him. Because he got me to think about Ben Borton there. Um, <laughs> he got me to think about what I thought when I said, oh, I don't see it that way. I see it like this. And helped me say, ah, okay, that's the way. It's a liberal religious community where we're free to share our thoughts and beliefs and spiritual practices and learn from one another, whether it's in small group gatherings or even coffee hour conversations or Sunday morning sermons and worship services or religious education presentations and discussions, even social gatherings, potluck dinners and brunches and conversations and even social justice events and so much more. It's always a possibility that we can hear something and learn something new. I'm so grateful for the religiously liberal Unitarian Universalist communities that I have been so fortunate to have been a part of over the past 30 years. And for the 25 years in which I've been able to serve UU congregations all across the country, the North, Northeast, Midwest, Southwest, and the Northeast again. I have never stopped learning and growing. And even here, now in my eighth year with you, in this beloved Unitarian community in Ithaca, my learning and growing continues. I still don't have all the answers. <clears throat> Thank you for all the good work that you do, all the lives that are blessed by their involvement in this community, and all that you've helped me learn and grow during these years with you. May the next chapter in this congregation's life be an ever greater blessing to all of those who come through these doors and join with you in religious community. Blessings on you all, on us all. Amen. I was sick as a dog in the hospital, and I honestly thought I was dying. I really did feel terrible. And, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and. And then all of a sudden, like out of this fog, I heard what I thought was David. And, 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 and I, I thought to myself, really, I am not like some kind of crazy Christian that I'm hearing like my prophet or anything like that. But I felt better. And I said to my friend, please go find out if that's really David. And it, hi, honey, I'm talking to somebody right now, OK? And, and, and it was, and he came around the corner and he sat with me and he held my hand until I fell asleep and I felt so much better. And then the other story about David, the really best story about David ever, is that my kid, who is not an affectionate kid, runs up to him and hugs him every time she sees him. Hi, I just wanted to say thank you, David, for all of this, uh, your service here at the congregation, and I'm sorry I didn't get to know you better, but I really am very grateful for all of the kindness, kindness and um, your sermons on mindfulness and the quality of peace that you brought to me. Thank you. David Grimm was like a breath of fresh air to this church, um, and I appreciated his confidence and his professionalism. Uh, he was a, he is a perfect minister who has made his, his calling, uh, uh, has influenced, influenced us all greatly.